Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 38th Common Ground Country Fair. Yay! My name is Heather Spaulding, and I'm the Deputy Director of MOFCA, and I'm so thrilled that you're all here today. What a gorgeous day we have to celebrate all, that, all the best that Maine has to offer. I'm so glad you're all here. Um, and I want to thank all of the volunteers who make this event happen. You'll see so many volunteers walking around in sort of in, in uh, oatmeal colored t-shirts with this beautiful design and also a lot of people with yellow t-shirts. Um, those are the folks who are also volunteers and are on our planning team and work tirelessly through the year to make this event happen. So how about a big round of applause for all the volunteers? Yay. Um, I am so thrilled to have this opportunity uh, to introduce a legend at MOFCA um, who's going to deliver our keynote address. He is a legend. Um, MOFCA started back in 1971, and our first fair was in Litchfield in 1977. And Shatanya York was an integral part of both of those entities and has been with us down through the ages and has given us so much inspiration and I am so grateful to him and to all the people who who pulled this together and made it what it is today it's just incredible um, and so I know that Shatanya has a, a lot of really fun anecdotes and and uh, really amazing stories to share with you and um, we're going to record this so for people who weren't able to attend let them know that uh, we'll be posting it online and WERU may be running it as well. Um, and also, um, there we're going to have a lot of laughter, and because Shatanya is such a hilarious guy, he's so funny. Um, we have a, a, a very nice uh, publication that will complement what Shatanya is going to share with us today. It's, it's called Fertile Ground, Celebrating 40 Years of Mafka. And we have a bunch of these over here if anyone wants to come get one after the talk. But um, I don't want to take up any more time. I just want to give a, a warm, heartfelt welcome to Shatanya York. Ah, it's great to be here. As my friend Alan would say in coaching me for this, don't worry, be happy. So I'm going to be as happy as I can today. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes when I get... Okay. Sometimes when I get up in the morning and I, I look in the mirror, I mean, I think, who is that old guy? You know, it's like I'm 70. And, uh, and, you, and you know what I like about growing old? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Actually, uh, what I appreciate about growing old is, uh, is uh, experience and experiences that have come to me with, uh, with aging. And when I was given this privilege of making this address and talking about the history of the fair, and I sat down, I closed my eyes, and uh, I was reflecting on what to say, and the first powerful realization that I had, and if I can say this without choking up, was that there was no way that I could make this speech without first introducing and acknowledging as many members of that first fair planning team as we could find. And thank to, thanks to one of the members, uh, Deborah Zesemann, uh, Newmark, who couldn't be here because she's in California, uh, you know, we work uh, hard to track, it, to track everybody down. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that afterwards. But in terms of the contribution that these members made, it was tremendous. And I'm going to have to go to my notes now. <clears throat> what you have to realize is that um, in the beginning, uh, there was no fair, uh, there was no planning team, there was no database of contacts, and um, we were precious low on money. And um, And I, uh, it became very clear to me that without the commitment 
in the dedication and the tenacity of that initial planning team, uh, we couldn't have done this. Um, it was an exhilarating and demanding experience, and our team did it under challenging circumstances, uh, to say the least. They were the right people in the right place at the right time, and like shoulders to stand on, they created the fair that first year, which became a foundation for the organization to perfect and expand support of MOFCA's mission and vision uh, going forward. And they did whatever needed to be done to make it happen. And what that entailed for some of them was working nights, working weekends. You know, we had meetings uh, once a month. And uh, commitment was the key to their effectiveness and it was a key to the creation of the fair. And I am reminded of what Goethe had to say about commitment. And I would like to reread Goethe's quote about commitment because it epitomizes their work and it epitomizes you know, how we created the fair and it happens to be my most favorite quote. Goethe said, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness, Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elemental truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too, a whole stream of all manner of unforeseen incidents, meetings, and material assistance, which no man or woman could have dreamt would have come his or her way, comes. Whatever you can dream or you can dream you can do, boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. And I also would like us to remember what Helen Keller said uh, about boldness. She said, life is a bold adventure or it is nothing at all. And so I give you the team, many of whom are here today, these are the bold people with the commitment who made it happen that first year and it is my privilege now uh, to introduce them and I'm going to give each one of them an, an, an acknowledgement plaque. We had a picture taken earlier this morning and there will be that picture going, going in the plaque. And I, um, Skip Howard, I want to introduce first. Let me read what's on the plaque. Black says, you made it happen. Thank you. Skip Howard, foot race. That was his responsibility that year. Member of the founding pl fair planning team that organized and planned Common Ground Country Fair established 1977, Litchfield, Litchfield, Maine. So Skip, if you come up, I'd like to just hand this to you. Paul Bernanke. <laughs> oh man, I love Paul's positive energy. Thank you, man. Thanks. Paul Chartrand, our second fair director, who one year through his brilliant management saved us $8,000. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Gretchen Everson. Oh, man, I love her enthusiasm. <laughs> and uh, Andy Haskell is here to receive the award uh, from his dad who uh, passed away in 2010. Andy, thank you. Your dad was uh, one of my favorite people. Tim Nason, my noble friend who has been so helpful in doing the research so that I could make this speech. 
Tim had responsibility for the fair book, what was incredible that first year. Sherry Spaulding, superintendent of the exhibition hall, so critical to the fair. Amy Thompson. Amy Thompson is here to receive this award for her mom, Tanel Sisko, who passed away in 87. And Tanel was one of my favorite people. And if you get a chance, uh, come up here afterwards. I would like you to see the first fair poster, which I'm going to hold up briefly, which uh, Tanel uh, made. And uh, it's still my favorite. Bridget Torrey! <laughs> Finally found. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you. You know, as I, as I said, um, when we started tracking people down, we found that we had, we had lost uh, three of our, of our members, Tanel and Michael, and also uh, Bruce Finlayson, and we're in the process of trying to find his sifts to make sure that he gets an, gets an acknowledgement plaque. Um, also, uh, I acknowledge Debbie Zezerman, who was our coordinator at, in the office. She did all the volunteers coordination. She, she helped with the exhibition hall, and she's been a, a, an incredible asset to me in, uh, in putting this together. Uh, there's some other people I want to quickly acknowledge. Uh, my friend and brother and the uh, treasurer during this whole process, uh, Alan Powell. Uh, he was always there representing our interest uh, with the board, uh, running interference. And uh, I talked to him last night, and he asked me to be sure to convey uh, his love and his support to you. Uh, I talked to him. He lives out in Sacramento now. Also, I want to acknowledge uh, my ex-wife, uh, Tova Starbird DeVos. Uh, she was Lynn in those days. I want to make it clear uh, that there was never a proposal that I submitted that she didn't review and improve it uh, with her additions, as well as being incredibly supportive during that, that period of time, including taking on responsibilities with the fair. And, uh, and my son, who uh, supports me unconditionally, and uh, who I uh, lost time with during the organizing of, of the fair. But it's still some of his fondest memories being three years at the fair. And I want to lastly acknowledge the Litchfield Farmers Club. I told uh, the members of the planning team this morning how we found the fairgrounds. We sent a, a letter, I sent a letter to all of the fairs in Maine with a postcard to send back if they thought they might be interested in renting us a fairgrounds. And it was... It was like um, uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. We got uh, three cards back, one from Pittston, one from uh, Windsor, and one from uh, Litchfield. I went to Pittston, and they uh, looked at it, and I said, no, it's too small. And we went to um, Windsor. It was too big. And we went to Litchfield, and, man, it was just perfect. It was, it was storybook. And then we met with them. We couldn't have worked with a better group. They were a farmer's club, and a farmer's club was an outgrowth of the agricultural societies of early Maine. The first fair in Maine was the state fair in 1820 in Mofka, and they established these societies, and then as an outgrowth of the societies, they had farmer's clubs. So the, the history of the Litchfield Farmer's Club went back like over a hundred years, and you know, you got to know that they were invaluable to us when we put the fair together. You know, they helped us with any aspect of the fair that you could think of. They were always available. All we had to do was, uh, was call on them. How did the fair come about? Um, the truth is that the fair came about as a dangerous opportunity. You know, when you've got a dangerous opportunity, you know, that acts as a, a real pressure cooker 
for creation. And what the dangerous opportunity was, I should tell you that uh, the Chinese definition of the word crisis is that, a dangerous, dangerous opportunity. Um, we didn't have any money. We were running out of money. We had been fortunate, given the largesse of a couple colleagues like L.B. Biden and Ron Poitras to submit a proposal and get funded through the Kendall Foundation for a couple of, a couple of years that gave us a office space and paid for staffing and also supported Northeast Cary in having a store and being able to uh, be on the cutting edge with appropriate technology. And one of the main things that we wanted to accomplish with that funding was to find a way to be self-sufficient, organizationally self-sufficient. Well, we didn't get there. And uh, it was coming down to the wire, and uh, we had a dangerous opportunity. And uh, I can remember Alan heading up the finance committee. I, I did a lot of reflecting, looking, looking at what kind of options there were out there. And I got to tell you that my greatest fear, you know, the thing that used to keep me awake at night was uh, that we, that I would unwittingly and knowingly uh, make the mistake of um, mission creep. Uh, mission creep is when you accept funding from a foundation or a corporation and in the process to get the money you compromise your organization's principles or mission and that leads to damaging the credibility of, of your organization. Just as a joke, an aside joke, there's, there's a joke among uh, nonprofit leaders. Uh, Reverend Buba, when he was uh, chair and president, executive director of the Maine Christian Civic League, um, he accepted a sizable contribution from the Maine Harness Society. And one of his board members uh, later said, um, Reverend Buba, you know, aren't you concerned? about accepting tainted money from a group that gambles? And Reverend Bubat said, tainted? Taint enough! Um, okay. Uh, I, you know, during this period of time, I did a lot of reflecting. And I was uh, reading things like E.F. Schumacher's book, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Matter, you know, especially the chapter on right livelihood. And uh, I was intrigued with right livelihood. Uh, you know, I just, that concept would not leave me. And, um, and then I started looking at, you know, well, what do we do well that could keep this inside the organization so that we could create uh, our own financial independence. You know, it's like we participated with the Spring Growth, which was an inspirational gathering. It had inspirational speakers like Sister Lucy and uh, Helen and Scott Nearing. Um, we had tremendous turnout at our agricultural trade shows. We had speakers come in that had national reputations. We had, we, uh, and we were working on a conference on alternative agriculture that had all the components to me that looked like a fair. And uh, that, was in, that was in 76. Uh, you know, we had entertainment, we had speakers, we had outside demonstrations, inside workshops, uh, farm tours, appropriate technology. And I thought, well, if this works, then I think that's leading to a fair. And um, it did work because two, two weeks before the conference, we were uh, 70 participants overprescribed, and we just kept squeezing people in. And then we had the famous, among a small circle of us, meeting uh, on the compost pile, which was actually a mulch pile, of our Vice President Nick Lohr and our Treasurer Alan Powell and myself, and our objective was to come up with a proposal for how we were going to meet our financial crisis and be ready to present it at the next board meeting. And uh, it may sound arrogant, but I went in prepared with my arguments for a fair, and I said, I'm not inside myself. I said, I'm not leaving here until we are committed to this idea of a fair. Well, it was interesting because about 
10 or 15 minutes into our brainstorming, uh, Nick Law said, well, what about a fair? And I said, I'm glad to hear you say that. And then we, you know, we sort of put it on the newsprint, you know, the, uh, the argument that we were going to make to the board of directors, which we did, and, uh, you know, the rest is, the rest is, is history. And now I want to I want to read this because I I was talking to a couple of the team members earlier and I was talking about um, you know what I would call uh, consciousness physics and how 25 years from now you know people will be having conversations about whether all minds are joined or not and whether you know some things take place at a at an unconscious level before you know a team comes together and you do something like a fair and people will say well of course that's how it is. And I can tell you that now, and you think I'm weird. But I put this in writing because I wanted to clarify it. Uh, like being the first monkey, sight unseen, who seemingly influenced the critical number of a hundred other monkeys to wash and eat sweet potatoes, thereby mysteriously resulting in every monkey on nearby islands doing the same thing. The greatest privilege of my working life was to be the first person to see the idea of common ground. And my observation and my experience was that that seed was in numerous other minds critical to the successful creation of the fair. And that included, first of all, these members of the planning team who we've acknowledged today. And it included board members. And it included um, chapter directors. And uh, it was as if the instant we'd reached that hundredth monkey, uh, the power of Victor Hugo's observation that nothing is so powerful as an idea whose time has come, kicked in. You know, and it's then the whole Mafka membership owned the idea, and they started sharing it uh, with, the, with the greater public, with the larger community. And uh, once this shift was realized, as a, another wise person once said, you know, once an idea's time comes, then even the people who say, you can't do it, contribute to the idea's time coming. And they actually reveal to you, you know, the corrections that you have to make. And, you know, and I saw that happen in our process where somebody would say, well, you can't do that. And we'd say, well, why not? Well, because you've got to do A, B, and D. Okay, we'll do it. So we did. Um, and this is really important. What gave the idea its significant power that continues to expand today is, is that it is an expression of a rightly li right livelihood whereby an organization expresses its noble mission and serves its members and the greater community uh, with this fair. Um, Simultaneously, providing the organization with right livelihood to continue its work. You know, and uh, uh, noting right livelihood in small is beautiful, and the subtitle being economics as if people mattered. You know, E.F. Schumacher talks about the power of character and the power of work and how people with character are drawn to organizations drawn to towns where there is an expression of right livelihood uh, like this fair. And that in expressing the character and doing the, the work, it's like a synergenic relationship between the character and the work. It strengthens the character and it strengthens the work. And, it, and both the strengthening of the character and the work strengthens the organization and draws more people to do it who then add their character and, and the power of their relationship with work to enlarging the, uh, the effectiveness of the organization. Look at the fairgrounds today. It's a, <laughs> now, obviously, this has to do with the meaning of money, uh, which we too little examine, or at least I too little examining. In his book, Money and the Meaning of Life, the philosopher Jacob Needleman says, now, now, in our time, the problem of money has to be faced as a problem of consciousness, a problem of being of man in the universal world. 
And then this, this one, gives, this, is, this is a quote that gives me chills. I mean, later on he says, to use the force of money intelligently is to become aware of its original function in uniting human beings in service to the highest. And for me, this service includes Mafka's mission and vision and the fair as an expression of economics as if people matter. I mean, as we're here today, um, you know, as we are here today, we support small businesses, small farms, farmers, and give socio-political groups an, a space for all of them. And in all of those instances, or almost all of them, I think that they are about economics as if people matter. And, uh, you know, and it, makes, <laughs> it makes me feel good today that, you know, we are here today and, uh, you know, we're aligned with, in affinity with, on the same vibration with, you know, other places on the planet uh, where they are about, you know, economics as if people matter, you know, where they're about uh, right livelihood, you know, places like Bhutan and uh, places like uh, Basque-speaking Spain, where by comparison with Spanish-speaking Spain, which has, I think, about 35% unemployment, Basque-speaking Spain has like 5%, less than 5% unemployment because their commitment is to community and to cooperation and to equality and to economics as if people matter. And, and, and that's how I, I perceive the fair. Um, now, let me just talk, <laughs> talk about how, you know, how we put the pieces to pieces to, together, and uh, my friend uh, Tim Nason has asked me, has encouraged me to talk about, you know, my own relationship, particularly in my youth with agriculture and agricultural values, and then how I was able to meld that experience with my work from Oscar and my, and my work for the fair. Uh, my formative years, um, one to five years old, I spent on my grandparents' small farm. They had the largest house garden in town, slaughtered pigs in the fall. We always had a hundred chicks come in, had eggs, chickens, hens, fruit trees, and my grandfather also had, a, uh, had market gardens that were a mile uh, down this dirt road. He had, he had uh, the bean field, the potato field, all small holdings because, you know, he was legally blind. He did everything by hand. And, uh, you know, once I'd been tro toilet trained, and, and I could walk, you know, he would take me to work with him on the, in the fields and on the farm, and, uh, you know, which meant I could really, you know, roam around the woods as long as I stayed within, uh, within shouting distance. And there's stories the family tells about him walking home with me sound asleep over his shoulder. Uh, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, I worked picking beans. We got paid two cents a pound. I never picked less than 150 pounds. Six days a week, eight hours a day, as long as we didn't get rained out. You know, when I was in the eighth grade, I worked with another kid on a potato farm, which also included knocking door to door in wealthy coastal communities to sell people um, potatoes. Oh, look at the cute kid, buy some potatoes. <laughs> and then in high school, I worked on uh, a dairy farm in Webster uh, with my friend Jack Davis, whose farm, his family had a wonderful dairy farm. Later on, I worked driving truck on an apple orchard, and then, and then I spent a year, you know, picking apples. But agriculture was always part of my life, and when I grew up with my grandparents, I ate at their table, I, I observed their rules, and I looked at life, you know, through their principles and their values. I went everywhere with them, with farm auctions, and um, my grandfather would take me when he met with uh, other small farmers. Um, and my favorite thing that we did together was we would go to Topsom Fair. And uh, the first place we went was the exhibition hall, then the animal barn, and then the pulling barns. And then as I got older, I went to more fairs, Farmington, Skowhegan, uh, Freiburg. And at a certain point, what I noticed was is that it didn't appear to be one event. It appeared to be two events. You know, there was the fair that reflected the traditions that had been there since 1820 when we had the first fair in Maine and the values of, uh, of rural life 
And then you had this other thing that was called the midway uh, that reflected baser values. I mean, that's where the freak show was. That's where the strip show was. You know, that's where the greasy food and the sugary food was. That's where you could, you know, that's where you could gamble. And when we were talking about putting the fair together and putting the pieces together, that was obviously a piece that we left out. And uh, also, another piece of the fair came as a result of some of us going every year to Towards Tomorrow, which was this, for lack of a better way to describe it, a new age fair that was held every year in Amherst on the campus of the University of Massachusetts, and it was like cutting edge stuff. I mean, if you wanted to see the latest technology in solar, in wind, in, you know, in uh, wood stoves, uh, photovoltaics, you know, that's where you went. And I remember going three years in a row, you know, uh, with this childlike excitement about seeing what was going to happen next. And we said, that's got to be part of, that has got to be part of this fair. Um, we'd also been involved with events like Spring Growth where we knew how inspirational it could be, you know, to have dynamic speakers. That had to be part of the fair. Uh, and then I had a personal relationship with Marshall Dodge. And um, I can remember when I asked him if he would come and perform at the fair and if he would do it for nothing. <laughs> and he said he would. And he did. And uh, he said, but Chaitanya, I'm not going to be able to get there till like 10.30. I said, that'll be fine. We'll be waiting for you. And I'll tell you, that night he was brilliant. So entertainment, because rural people like to laugh, like to dance, like to celebrate after the harvest. You know, we always had, you know, entertainment, you know, singers and humorists. Um, so, now... You know, let's talk a little bit about my, my role, uh, my part that I got to play for, for a few years. Um, my first responsibility was to raise money. You know, it's like, okay, Chaitanya, go find the money. It was to chair meetings and to fix problems with Alan's help. And, uh, you know, the expectation of the planning team was is that I would deal with problems that related specifically with the board. And then... Uh, one of my responsibilities was to sh share the idea of the fair. And you will note that I didn't say sell the fair. I didn't say market the fair. I said share the idea of the fair because that's where the power was. And to do that, uh, you know, I visited, I visited chapters. I talked to them about the fair. It's like people got it. They got what we were going to do. And uh, they appreciated the, the concept of, of, uh, of, right, of right livelihood. And my last responsibility, my last responsibility was to finally get things out of the team's way so that they could do their work and make it happen, which they did. Um, I also have been asked if uh, I would talk about um, some of the accomplishments of uh, of, of Mosca. Uh, and, and before I, I do that, uh, you know, I want to finish up the discussion on the discussion on money because our objective long term was to get to the place where we were organizationally self-sufficient. You know, and uh, we were willing to be outrageous on the planning team, to be unreasonable. And one of the things that we did that was unreasonable was we said we are going to have 10,000 people at this fair. Now, this was a first-year fair. This had never been done before. We say we're going to have 10,000 people there. And we said, and we're going to clear $10,000. Well, after everything was said and done, we had almost exactly 10,000 people who attended the fair that first year. And uh, we earned $19,500. You know, after expenses, uh, we had $10,500. We got there. But, you know, I got to acknowledge heroic acts here because in order to get there, one of the things that we had to do, three months before we got to the, no, it was, no, it was about two months and three weeks before we got to the fair, we got, we had unexpected expenses. Because what you got to realize was 
We had the MOFCA budget that we're, we're dealing with, which is always which was already challenged, and we had another budget for the fair. And uh, you know, we were managing these both at the same time. And uh, fortunately, we had friends at the National Center for Appropriate Technology that gave us $3,600 for the appropriate technology side of the fair. We had supportive people at the Kendall Foundation that gave us four grand for organizing the fair. And we had, uh, we got the largest grant that they ever give from the Haymarket Foundation, 2,500. Uh, but all because fundraising is personal and we had people with each of those organizations that supported what we were up to. But in terms of heroic efforts, I can remember that had to be one of the most troubling days of the fair planning process for me because we kept looking at the numbers and thought, oh man, we, this is thousands. I sat down with the, with the staff, Tanel, Tim, myself, Paul, and Deborah, and I said, would you guys be willing to go two and a half months on half salary so that we would have enough money to get to the fair? I mean, do you realize what a tremendous request that is? They said yes, and uh, I promised them that we would pay them back uh, once we had the fair. The fair was successful, uh, and we paid them back. Now, three weeks before the fair, I don't know what the additional expense was. I don't know if it was policing or security or equipment that we needed to buy that we hadn't anticipated, but we were another $2,000 short. So I called my friend Frank Hampel, who I call the, the planner, and I said, Frank, uh, we got to have $2,000 help us find $2,000, somebody who will loan it to us uh, for low interest, uh, give it to us quickly, and we'll pay him back in a month. Frank said, give me a couple days. So he called me back the next day, and he said, you know, that he had talked to Michael Mastronati, who was a mutual friend of ours, an attorney who was sensitive to uh, community development and community issues, and he said, Michael has found an anonymous donor. He will loan you $2,000 at no interest for one month, and you've got to have three co-signers. Frank Hempel, Deborah Zesman, and myself were the co-signers. Uh, the fair was successful, and uh, we paid back the money. Uh, I talked to David Vale about this, and I want to get it in. Um, you know, you've got to realize that the fair happened in a specific context. <laughs> There's a high school graduate senior friend of mine. We went to school together. Hi, Pam. <laughs> um, it happened in a specific context, which I call the time of the seas. And uh, these were sea words which described the context that we were working in from, say, 75 to 79. And it, and it, and it also was words that were often used during that period of time. Though there were words like culture, commitment, Community, cooperation, cooperative, collaboration, consensus, consortium, collective, communication, coordination, civility, context, change, creation, citizenry, conservation, consideration, uh, common ground. And, you know, in a three, two year period while we were working on that fair, you know, other, you know, fantastic things were happening. I mean, like Elliot Coleman had a uh, tour, a three-week tour of small and biological uh, farms in Europe. Tim, Frank Eggert, myself, Elliot, and Barbara Eggert went on that tour. We, we were the single group, in a, an organic group in America who had the most representation. We got to go to the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements annual meeting. You know, we got to listen to brilliant people like Claude O'Bear, who had written the definitive European book on biological agriculture. Uh, Hadi Volkman, who was the uh, director of the uh, Institute for Biological Husbandry in Oberwil, Switzerland, highly respected around the world, including at, at, at USDA. And all four of us came back from that experience, transformed, and we brought that energy uh, into the fair because, you know, we were changed such that we knew that whatever you called it, biological or organic agriculture, it was economically viable. It was environmentally sound. It was culturally supported, you know, and it was, it was technically, technically feasible. We got to go to places like um, 
this guy named Weichel who just loved to invent things and we got to see his appropriate technology for biological farmers to use. Uh, during the same period of time, I think there were like 16 different meetings, one every month, of people who were interested in putting together the Federation of Cooperatives. And the agreement was that you don't make a decision until it's made by consensus. And on that 16th meeting, everybody agreed FEDCO is now here to stay, and you know uh, the value of that every year when you go to do your planting. Um, also during this three-year period, uh, there was a, a group that was dynamic and powerful and had broad-reaching influence on uh, Maine, and that was the Maine Consortium for Food Self-Reliance, which included MOFCA, Sam Eli Land Trust, uh, the Small Farms Research Development Project at, at Bowdoin, uh, I think I said Sam Eli Land Trust, FEDCO, Center for Human Ecology, Center for Human Ecology Studies and Coastal Enterprises Incorporated, uh, and it focused on uh, legislation writing, policy making, research and, and planning, and uh, if you ever get a chance and they're available, see, I hope I can remember David, it's like after the Food and Farmland Study Commission uh, issued its findings, uh, then another study was done by five members of the consortium, which is called the Past, Present, and Future Competitiveness of Maine Agriculture, and it is a brilliant piece of work. Um, okay. Uh, I was also asked about accomplishments. Can I keep on going or am I, am I tying in? Okay. All right, accomplishments for MOFCA. It's like I was thinking about, well, what kind of criteria should I have for, uh, for accomplishments for MOFCA? And um, the criteria is, you know, what I love to do and what was fun. And that was working with the chapters because it's like, one year, 78, we had committed to having a chapter in every county. And that year, we had a chapter in 15 counties. Remember, we have 16 counties in Maine. And we had a meeting that had been set up for Piscataquis County so that they could establish their chapter. And there, and there were six chapter, and there were six counties that had two chapters. So at one point, we had 21 active chapters in the state of Maine. And as far as I was concerned, you know, that's where it was happening. I mean, if there was any way that you could check with what was going on in any one month, you could go to any one of those chapters. Uh, you know, they almost invariably had great speakers. They were focused on some educational topic. So you could be learning something from biodynamic gardening to uh, composting to apple tree pruning. There was always a great potluck supper. And, you know, and they were the heart of cooperation when we wanted to get something done. You know, things like co-op orders. It doesn't sound like a lot of rock phosphate, but um, colloidal rock phosphate orders, we do like 181 tons. And the savings would be phenomenal because we did it cooperatively. There would be a boxcar director, four or five boxcars coming into the state. Then there'd be directors in each one of the county who direct the orders, and then they'd just execute the organization. People would drive in, pick up their product, and go home. And then they also, the bo they also played a significant role in terms of, of legislation. You know, when we were supporting the uh, farm, land, and open space law, which uh, had been initi initiated, the changes had been initiated uh, by David Kennedy, who was one of our, one of our members, um, whether it was the, the food and farmland, uh, whether it was the farm and open space law, you know, getting that passed and giving testimony, or it was the food and farmland study commission getting that passed and giving testimony, or it was the Agricultural Development Act of 1980, it's like our members were right there, and the way that we contacted them was through the chapters, uh, they had phone trees, and uh, they played a significant role, which I don't think people realize, in terms of, uh, of uh, passing legislation. Um, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with, with making some requests of you. <laughs> I'll make this quickly. Um, I resist being political, and I went through a recent transformation. 
and I am echoing Plato's request of us. Plato had requested us, you know, to take political responsibility. And so I am passing that on from Plato to you today, to take political responsibility, whatever your concern is. I don't know if it's GMOs, you know, uh, chemical spraying, whatever. Um, and I'm also, this is my second request. And all, these, are, these have started with me because these are requests that I am challenging myself with every day. And that is complain to somebody who can do something about it. Because, you know, Eileen will sit at the table with me and listen to me complain about, you know, what did some senator say or do? And she'll say, you know, I'm tired of listening to this. <laughs> so what I am attempting to do now is I have got all the members of the delegation, the two senators, the two representatives, and my two, uh, my state representative, my state senator, and my cell phone. So when I find myself complaining, then I think, okay, I got to complain to somebody who can do something about this. And then call these people after hours. You don't even have to talk to anybody. They'll give you a number and then just leave your message. You can say, I want you to support this piece of legislation because it's in the best interest of people, or whatever it is. And then my last request is about book reading. Um, I am requesting that if you haven't read, or if you have read, go back and reread it, uh, Common Sense by Thomas Paine, who in my opinion, I could make an argument that he was more a father of America than George Washington was. And uh, if you don't know much about uh, Thomas Paine, go on uh, C-SPAN and uh, Google Thomas Paine. There was an incredible panel discussion that included uh, Dr. Cornell West and um, Richard Wolf, and I can't remember the other is a, is a, is a brilliant investigative reporter, but uh, that'll give you everything you need to know about Thomas Paine. And also, if you haven't read, or if you haven't read in a while, um, Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered, please read it. It's so timely. It is so timely. Uh, and if you haven't read Money and the Meaning of Life by Needleman, it's a brilliant book. It is a brilliant book. And then lastly, um, you might want to consider uh, Nader's new book, which is um, Unstoppable, uh, the Emerging uh, Left-Right Alliance. I love you. Thank you for being so patient. Have a great fair.